I think we're finally at the point where I can say this video is going to be tiled or something tiled along the lines of my A7 IV review. I've been using this a ton since it came out and I have a lot of thoughts in no particular order. We're going to be talking about those today. Let me start off by saying this is probably the most refined of all the Sony cameras that I've ever used or owned. This feels like the camera that Sony has taken the most amount of feedback from what people have been saying and they've actually implemented things that people have been saying or complaining about. But with that said, this camera is not going to be for everybody. Now that wasn't the case when the a7 III came out because that was the latest and greatest tech. It had the best of what was available at the time, and that was nearly four years ago. Four years later, we now have things like 4K 60, 4K 120, and this doesn't have everything in it, but as a hybrid camera, it has most of the important stuff that most people are using. So this camera is not gonna be for everyone, and I say that loosely, because there's one big thing, and we may as well get it just out of the way straight away, the 4K60 and the fact that it has a crop. Now, if you're someone that's gonna be shooting video and you need 4K60 and you need something like a wide lens, like you need to use a 1635 like I have on this right now, that's obviously not going to work at 16, which does pose a problem. And there's been a lot of times where I've gone to pick a camera for a shoot, a client shoot, real estate, and I have purposely avoided this camera because I can't shoot in the way I need to shoot. Now, I did just put a video a couple of days ago that. I'm gonna put up here, which is talking about a workaround for that. But if you don't have the money to buy a lens or you don't wanna to have to deal with that, this might not be the camera for you. But if you don't need wide in 4K60, then that's really not an issue for you whatsoever. Or if you have an A7S III or an FX3 and this is maybe your B or your C camera, then you just kind of go towards that camera instead of picking up this one. And I will actually say that as a B camera or a C camera to the A7S III or the FX3, this is fantastic. It completely holds its own in all the modes. The colors match almost perfectly. It's a great option, the cheapest option for a B or C camera if you have an A7S III or an FX3 or an FX6. So that's why I said it's not gonna be the camera for everybody loosely. It really depends on what it is that you shoot. If you shoot real estate, you need wide. Probably not for you if it's for video. Now that one's out of the way, let's talk about some of the great things about this camera. There's some features in this which I just can't wait to see in all of Sony's other cameras, hopefully even in some firmware updates in the future. I love that the manual focus override is in this, which they, I don't know the technical term for what it's called, but it's in the FX6. So if you're in autofocus mode and you want to quickly pull focus yourself, you can just touch the manual focus ring and it'll override and allow you to manually focus. And then after a second or so, it'll just default back to autofocus. The little switch on here to go from photo to video to S and Q mode, just perfect and such a useful feature that I've used a ton. When I first got it, I didn't think I would be using as much as I have, but just having that on there now is so useful. And when I pick up the FX3 or the A7S3 now, I, I just wish that little dial was there. On top of that, with the A7 IV, you can actually split up some certain settings. You can specify certain things through transfer across from photo mode to video mode and vice versa. For example, if you want to make sure that your shutter speed stays the same in video at 1 50th, but then in photo mode, you can change it to whatever you want. And then when you go back to video mode, it'll still be at 1 50th. You can do that. You do the same with apertures, so you can completely separate your settings out. And also a big one, you can have log in video and then not log in photos. And that was something that we haven't seen in the Sony camera before. Typically what would happen is if you have your log mode turned on, you go to photos, you forget about it, you take pictures, you realize you've taken photos in log. That has been completely fixed with this camera, allowing you to separate the settings up. Before we go any further, a quick word from today's sponsor, which is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform for people who want to continue to learn throughout their life. And that's really important that you don't stay stagnant. You're always learning new things. There are thousands of classes that you can take at your own convenience. There's no ads that you have to skip through or anything like that. You don't have to just wait for the five second timer to count down and then click skip ad. There's none of that. You can learn at your own convenience, whether you want to do it on your iPad or on your phone or on your desktop. Whenever you have spare time, you can jump on and continue classes at your own pace. And you'd actually be surprised at how many creative people are on there from YouTube with their own classes. Ali Abdal, great class on how to manage productivity and keep your workflow in check. Things like keeping lists, the Pomodoro technique, if you're not aware of that one. Nathaniel Drew, you probably heard of him, has a great class on how to confidently talk to the camera if it's not something you're used to doing. The power of how editing can do a lot to make your video seem more engaging. And there's also my favorite one still, MKBHD, who has a complete masterclass on how to start a YouTube channel if it's something you've been looking at doing. The first 1,000 people that click the link down below will actually get their first month of Skillshare for free, so you don't have to pay anything. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to this video, my video, the video about the A7 IV. 
Now, for the past year and a half, I have been using the a7S III as my primary hybrid camera for photo and for video. 12 megapixels, yes, was all I had. And it, it's been okay. I haven't really had any issues where I wish I needed more. But there's been the occasional time where I've done a lens test or a lens review and I've zoomed in and I just wish there was a bit more in terms of megapixels. And now I am very happy to have that back. It's gonna be really hard to go back from 33 megapixels now back to something like 12. It's great to have 33 megapixels and 4K in a camera all at once. If I didn't need 4K 60 for a job, you could just take this camera and it'd probably be okay. Now here's one of my absolute favorite things about the a7 III when I first got it, and that's crop mode. And I'm so happy to have it back. I've missed it dearly from the FX3 and the a7S III for photo and for video. 33 megapixels in the a7S III means 14 megapixels in crop mode is a good amount for a lot of things. And it means every lens just has more flexibility to it. If you need a quick shot of something and you're using the wrong lens and you can potentially use crop mode to get it, that saves you time and it's just a useful feature. And the same thing applies to video as well, just having that little bit of extra reach on a lens. Or if I'm at a wedding and I wanna shoot with a 7200 and I just need that little bit of extra reach 1.5 times and there's no loss of quality. That is gonna be so useful and that's why this is gonna be a big deal for me when it comes to the summer and shooting weddings. I have it assigned to my C2 button on here. I'm pushing it and I'm pushing it all the time in and out of crop mode for photo, for video. So happy it's back. I say it's back, I mean, it never really went away. It's just I've had a camera, the a7S III or the FX3 that didn't have it because that was only 12 megapixels. Now there is another elephant in the room when it comes to a big issue with the a7IV and I did a whole video about it and I'll link that up there. And that is overheating. In case you haven't watched my video, basically with this camera, if you have the screen closed into the body like this for 4K60, you are going to have issues with overheating to the point where the camera is going to shut down. You're gonna get a good amount of time shooting 4K24, but you could potentially run into issues as well. The best way to get around this is to simply open up the screen. If you're a little bit worried, if it is really hot where you are, you can open the battery door as well. That just allows more air to circulate around the camera, the heat to dissipate from the body. And that's gonna be the best case scenario you can get to reduce any potential overheating issues with the a7 IV. Low light performance for video on this camera, fantastic. I'm not gonna go into details about it. It's been compared by everybody and their dog to the a7S III, the FX3, the A1. Probably go check Gerald's video. I think he did a pretty good one on it. One thing that makes this stand out as a better camera versus the a7S III and the FX3, on those cameras, there's two base ISOs. So at 640 and at 12,800. So if you're in like the mid low light abilities of those cameras, 4,000, 5,000 ISO, you might start to see some noise. Now that noise isn't reduced until you get into the 12,800, which is your second base ISO. And then you see a big difference in terms of the noise in your image. With this camera, you can actually use it in those 4,000, 5,000 ISOs, and you're gonna get a better quality image. When I say better quality, I mean less noise compared to the FX3 and the A7S III because they're gonna be more noisy at those ISOs and it's not gonna get less noisy until you hit 12,800. So this is actually a more versatile camera when you're in those mid kind of ISOs. That's something to bear in mind. If you shoot weddings like I do, that could actually make this camera more usable in certain situations where it's it's kind of dark, but it's not too dark. And you, you don't want to have to slap on an ND filter to go up to 12,800 with an A7S III or an FX3. If you shoot in those ISOs, in those territories, you know what I mean. This is a strange one because I've got no easy way to prove it. But if you shoot with this camera and you shot with the A7S III or the FX3, you might know what I mean. There's something about the IBIS in this camera that feels just a little bit better, a little bit more refined. And I don't have an easy way to show it to you, but when you use this camera and you feel it and you, you see it working, it just seems better. That might just be me. If you have the same experience, pop a comment down below, but it feels better to me. And what I'm talking about is when you're using the active stabilization. And for photos, I've actually been shooting all my HDR stuff for real estate. I hate HDR, but what they want sometimes and i've been doing all handheld a7 IV was the first camera that has focus breathing compensation which is a software fix for breathing in lenses most sony lenses are stills lenses they're not designed for video we just all use them for video so this allows you to completely reduce the focus breathing to the point where it almost just doesn't exist now it is limited by certain lenses sony lenses only which is kind of a pain for people like me who like to use a sigma 24 to 70 a lot but 
Sony kind of has to keep people within their ecosystem somehow. And this is a really easy way to do that. If you have a GM from the last few years or one of the G lenses, you'll be able to use focus breathing compensation. But on some of the older Sony lenses, it doesn't work. Like the 16 to 35 right here, F4 does not work. I do really like the focus mapping as well. I haven't used it a ton, but there's been a few situations where you just aren't able to easily and quickly tell what is in focus. Focus peaking can be hit and miss sometimes in terms of quickly being able to see what is in focus. But with the mapping, it's way quicker to see because what is is not covered by a color is basically in focus. So it's a, a much better tool for quickly focusing with video. Now, I know I keep comparing this to the a7S III and the FX3, but Here's something else which stands by my point I said at the beginning where this feels like the most refined camera. Turn on time for this is faster than either of my other cameras, the FX3 or the A7S III. Memory card format time is substantially faster than either of those cameras. There's also a really interesting one I noticed where you have the one, two, and three dial on here, and that's just to pull us out of custom settings. And you have the same thing on the A7S III. But on the A7S III, when you turn that dial, it forces you to push OK to confirm the settings that you want to pull up first. So when you turn the dial, it will show you all your settings. You have assigned to one, two, or three, then you click OK to confirm you actually want to pull those. I complained about this in a video I made about the FX3. So I'm gonna take the credit for this one and think that Sony maybe listened, because now when you just turn it on the A7IV, it just automatically pulls those settings you don't have to click OK and it's just faster to pull them and it means this camera is just more enjoyable to use because it's quicker to go between things. Also, when you hit menu on the A7S III or the FX3, there's this little tiny split second animation that comes in and you don't have that on the A7 IV. So if you push menu on both cameras at the same time, this loads the menu faster. Little tweaks, little implementations like that make this just feel like a more refined camera. One of the very first things I noticed on this camera in the specs when it came out was how this had a lesser quality screen in terms of dots compared to the A7S III and the FX3. It had a little tiny bump over the A7 III. I would have liked to have seen the same screen that was in the A7S III or FX3. With that said, it seems like Sony has changed the resolution of all the menus, of all the assists on the screen, because this feels like a higher quality screen when you're looking at it compared to the A7S III or the FX3. On the A7S III, on the FX3, all other Sony cameras, the menus just look stretched. The wording and the fonts always looked kind of odd, but we just dealt with it. It doesn't on this. It's all been formatted properly now. The screen is a different size to those cameras as well. It's a little bit wider. So maybe it actually fits the uh, the design of the menus a little bit better and the other cameras didn't. But this feels like a higher quality screen than those cameras. And it's not. It's like 30% lower res or something like that. The body design as well, it just feels a little bit different. The grip is very nice. It feels deep on there. It feels like a better version of the A7 III grip. It feels like a better version of the A7S III grip, which I really like. The finish is just a little bit different. And overall, again, just feels like little refinements that... I hope we see on all cameras moving forwards. And I think that's really it. That's everything I th think about this camera so far. I'm sure there's gonna be other things that I come across over the months and in my update, which I'll probably do like a year. So maybe in like November, December time, I'll have more thoughts about this, but that's everything I think about this camera so far. All of the good, all of the bad. There's not that much bad if you can deal with the crop and the overheating issues. It's a great camera. It's probably the best hybrid camera out there for photo, for video. If you need a camera that does both and you can deal with the 4K60 prop if you need to shoot wide. Thank you for watching today. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.